A very good evening. I'm Soumya, and I extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of IHS. We thank you all for registering for today's webinar. And as you all are aware, uh, we've opened the application process for the Urban Fellowship Program for the year 2022-23. And uh, in the following weeks, we have planned a few sessions, a few webinars to take you through the various aspects of the fellowship program. Today's webinar will be on introducing the Urban Fellowship Program, and our speaker is Sudeshna Mitra. She is the lead of academics and research at IHS, and also a teaching faculty uh, for the fellowship program. Uh, her session will be for about 20 to 25 minutes, post which she'll answer uh, your queries, any queries that you have. So I request you to please drop your questions or queries in the Q&A box. Okay, so, Thank you again. Over to you, Sudeshna. Thank you so much, Soumya. Uh, again, from my side also, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, as Soumya mentioned, I will be giving you an introduction to the Urban Fellows Program at IHS. And I will keep my introduction relatively short uh, and open it up to any clarifications, any details, any further questions that you have. Uh, so Soumya has also told you this, but I'm going to just uh, repeat it one more time. In your panel, you will see there is a Q&A link and there is a chat link. If you can please put your questions in the Q&A. If you put it in the chat, then we won't be able to pick it up. Okay, so in the Q&A is the way we are going to uh, look at the questions and answer them at the end of the session. So uh, that said, uh, let me start. And so, you know, firstly, um, so I'm just giving you the introduction. So I have been, my name is Sudeshna Mitra and I've been here uh, at IHS for a while. I've also been involved with the Urban Fellows Program from its very beginning. So there's a group of us that kind of came together to design um, and put together a program that was taking a novel approach into thinking, uh, learning and doing work on the urban. Uh, in this, I call it novel because this is not a planning program or an architecture program. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about why it's not that. But it is the flagship program, uh, flagship teaching program that we have at uh, IHS right now. Um, it is eventually when we have a university, it will become a two-year master's program, the same kind of content. But right now we have sort of a shorter version of a master's program in this um, you know, nine to 10 month immersive uh, residential uh, program that we have, right? So this is, um, so just to kind of start with that. So the Urban Fellows Program uh, runs from between nine months to 10 months. It depends on you know, the, the holidays and et cetera that you get. So it may extend into 10 months. And it's a fully residential, fully immersive, uh, program which is residential, right? So you have to come to Bangalore, you have to be in Bangalore to take the classes. It's also a scholarship-based program, which means that we have a pretty um, intensive admission process. We get a lot of applications, but if you make the cut, if you are selected as a part of the admission process, then are we try the utmost and the hardest to make sure that financial reasons don't stand in the way of your accepting the admission into the program. So we have over the years had many students come to us who are first generation learners. You know, they are the first in their families to have gone for higher education. And we are extremely interested in bringing people with these different kinds of life experiences, these different kinds of perspectives uh, their own personal perspectives, the work that they may have done, those perspectives together to enrich the kind of teaching learning environment at the Urban Fellows Program. So do remember that um, we, we take the idea of diversity and we take the idea of scholarships quite seriously as a part of this program. Now to backtrack a little bit, when I talked about that this is an urban fellowship, urban program takes a novel approach. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with, uh, with the work that the Indian Institute for Human Settlements does. And uh, you may know that uh, the focus, the priority here is 
to look at urban questions more particularly and human settlement questions uh, more broadly. Now, what do I mean by that? So uh, this is a way to sort of think about that the city is not necessarily, it can't be put on a map in terms of drawing a boundary and sort of saying that here is where the cities are in the country, right? Over the last couple of years with uh, the outbreak of COVID, with the lockdowns that we have faced, we have started to become aware, even if we had not familiar with this before, that the urban has become a very significant component of India's larger development story itself. There are many people who call the urban a second home or a third home. The footprint that the urban has in the lives of people goes much beyond that line and that boundary that you can draw on a map and say, this is the city and this is everything else outside it. So think about it, for example, just to kind of put it in terms of, you know, what we encounter every day, you might think about it in terms of like, for example, these uh, scores of people who call the urban a first home, second home. So you can think about it in terms of people, right? You can think about it in terms of the story of migration, the story of employment, the story of economy that has become very clear to us over the last couple of years, especially, not just in terms of GDP numbers, like an abstract number that talks about how many uh, crores is the size of the economy, but the economy in terms of what people do, where do they work, where do they live, how do they get food, what kind of infrastructure do they need? So the economy as sort of a linked concept. So you can think about the urban in terms of people. You can also think about it in terms of resources right? What is getting produced for urban consumption? How is it getting transported across the country to get to various kinds of centers, places where people are consuming these products? What kind of an impact does it have on production cycles, on weather cycles, on climate change? How are these, you know, resource flows uh, changing because of uh, all the kinds of issues that are coming up that we are becoming familiar with and we are beginning to tackle now? You can think about it not only in terms of things that we produce and consume, but the things that we throw away. You can think about it in terms of waste. Who is producing the waste? What kind of waste is getting produced? Where is it getting dumped? None of these questions, none of these answers can be really held within the idea of a city within a boundary. It has much larger footprints beyond that. It has a life beyond that boundary. Right? You can even think about it in terms of more intangible things, right? Uh, like energy. Where is electricity produced? Why is it produced in a particular way? What kind of distribution systems do we need to kind of get it to the homes that people have in different places? All of this has an urban connotation to it. Right? And many of these questions in the times that we live in are posing new challenges. They are becoming, there are resource constraints, there are financing constraints, there is inequality that is growing. And so more and more people are, um, you know, falling back on public programs or are becoming more vulnerable or falling back on their social networks to make, you know, their life in the urban and outside the urban possible. So, while the, none of these questions are new, none of these uh, problems are, you know, something that has just emerged, but we have better and new understanding about them in the times that we are living in, where climate change, where the idea of the Anthropocene, where the idea of resource depletion, the questions of, you know, urban health, uh, contagion, air pollution, all of these things are now that we finally put on the table and said, these are things that we need to think about and how do we think about them and go beyond the traditional ways in which we have solved these problems. What else do we need to think about, right? And so these are dynamic and these are changing. And a lot of IHS's work is actually, you know, is, is an intervention, both in terms of figuring out new knowledge and research around these questions to understand it better, but also in terms of advising and implementation of what do we then do if we have a better understanding of these things. And the Urban Fellows Program is really our attempt to convert the knowledge and the way that we practice the urban in IHS 
can then become something that we are able to pass on to a new generation of researchers and practitioners who will continue to do more research and do more practice and figure out you know, the newer and newer ways in which we have to tackle these issues as we go forward into the future. Okay? So that's, you know, the kind of the reason why we came out with the program in the beginning, like this was this was our vision, this was our objective. So one of the critical parts of this is that we wanted to, and this is true for the work that we do in IHS generally, is that we wanted to break out of disciplinary silos. This is what I meant, that this is not a planning program, an architecture program. So what disciplinary silos do? So if you're a planner, I personally am sort of trained as a planner, but I've also worked on economic development. I also work on governance. And when you realize that when you go forward, like when you study something and then you go forward and start to do practice, you realize that the techniques and the knowledge that are there in one discipline will get you only so far. They leave a lot out for other people and other disciplines to then complete it to make sure that that implementation actually happens. But the idea, but in 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 a lot of like disciplinary training, this idea of the other, who is going to do the other portions of it, the person is very ambiguous. It's an amorphous concept that we have prepared this. Now the government will take this and they will do this. The engineers will pick this up and they will do this, or the finance person will come and do this. But as a student, you don't get to encounter these other disciplines, right? So let me give you like a quick example that will put this. Say for example, there's a settlement that's just on the edge of the city or which is you know, inside the city and a whole city has grown around it and infrastructure has to be provided. Now, when infrastructure has to be provided, a planner will first have to assess the demand, how much of water, how much sewerage, how much solid waste management has to be produced has to be provided in that area. The engineer will have to do the calculations, the technical calculations of the pipe uh, dimensions, the length of the pipe that will be required, what kind of materials are going to be required for things like that. You might need a finance expert to figure out the costing and the pricing. You might need an institutional expert, a governance expert to figure out how many government bodies will have to be involved to make sure the whole implementation happens and what role will they all play. You might require a sociologist who will go and talk to the community and figure out what kind of problems are they having with infrastructure. So when you're kind of doing an infrastructure implementation, it actually meets the community's requirements and it's not something that you're providing something and they need something else entirely. You may need someone with a law background if the settlement has ownership or tenure issues, if it's not legal, if it is you know, on public land, say you might have legal issues associated with that settlement for which you might need a lawyer. You might need a media and communications expert who will be able to talk about, you know, talk to the community, talk to the government people, create awareness about public subsidies, public programs that may be availed uh, you know, to finance the project or to make, give subsidies to the user fees that are being charged in that area. So for even a small project like this, you realize that there are seven or eight different experts that you require. And each one of those seven or eight experts have to not only do their own job, but they also have to learn how to talk to one another. And this is what we're trying to do in the UFP, is not just asking you to become some other discipline, but to speak from your discipline, be open to pushing the envelope about, you know, how to have conversations, how to be familiar with the vocabulary of other disciplines that will also be required to kind of get one thing done in the urban area, right? And so, the practice of interdisciplinarity. Many programs talk about the idea and the concept and the themes of interdisciplinarity. But what happens is that while you might have all the good intentions of doing interdisciplinarity, when it comes to sitting across a table with another person who talks a very different kind of language, it becomes hard to even listen to what they are saying. It becomes hard to follow the, the words that they're using. It becomes hard to understand the perspective how they are not like seeing what you see as the priority. They may have a different priority and you have fights because you can't understand why these priorities don't match. So actually the practice of disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity is a much harder thing to learn. And it's a lifetime, uh, you know, sort of a approach that happens. It, it's something that you learn over your lifetime. 
but we get you started in the UFP. We're not only interested in interdisciplinarity as a concept, but we're interested in interdisciplinarity as practice and you know, making the mistakes and learning from it and learning the vocabulary and learning the sort of the ways of navigating a whole range of other uh, people who come from other disciplinary trainings together. How do we do this? Like one of the ways that we, uh, this thing is that this program is open to everybody from who is interested in the urban. It doesn't matter which disciplinary background you come from. As I gave you in that example, you may come from a law background, but you're interested in working on urban issues, on land questions in the urban area, or on um, you know, various kinds of litigations that are located in urban life. You may come from a management background, you may come from an engineering background, or a media and communications background, or a planning or an architecture background. You may have already done urban studies before, but the thing is that again, we're talking about that the training may you know, may have left you asking the question, but what is missing? Why is this not actually getting implemented? Why is, am I only looking at this as an architect? Why am I only looking at the, what's happening inside the plot? What's happening around that plot area? That sheet is white around that plot area. Or as a planner, when I made a particularly beautiful plan, but in implementation, we're not seeing that plan actually getting implemented. Right? So when you have this kind of, uh, you know, almost a frustration or a question or a curiosity as to why isn't this enough, those are the kind of people that we want to see in the program, right? And we've been like told with organizations where our students have gone before is this is usually something that people learn in the first two or three years of their working. They learn that they need to bring in their own expertise and their own knowledge, but they need to learn to work with other people. They need to learn to understand other kinds of vocabulary and approaches that are there. So in some ways, we wanted to create a program that would help you navigate those first two, three years, teach you some of those things that are not usually taught in usual programs as a part of the UFP itself. The structure of the UFP keeps this in mind. So you have broadly uh, three parts to it. You have a common term, you have an elective term, and you have an internship term. So the common term is something that everybody in the class is going to take together. There are six different layers that we have. These are th six thematic layers. You have a planning in the urban, you have uh, identity and social practice, urban governance, urban economy, urban sustainability, and urban infrastructure, right? As you can see, each one of them is anchored in some way in some discipline, but they are going beyond those, right? And they're taught in conjunction, which means that if you come from a certain background, you will find yourself right at home, at least in one of those layers, but you will learn a lot of new things across the other five, right? And may actually be quite uncomfortable when those other five are being taught, but that is actually part of the program that you have to learn to see the, you know, just to appreciate that by going beyond the limits of your own discipline, you can see and understand new things, right? So those six layers are taught in, you know, together in the commons layer. It is supplemented with skill labs. It is supplement, not supplemented, but equally sort of held almost like a 50% um, share with a field-based practica. Now that field-based practica is again our way of getting you to practice interdisciplinarity. You will be put in groups which will be composed of people with a, lots of different kinds of disciplines. You will have, you will be given, you will send to the field without a question. So you have to learn from the field, what is the question that needs to be answered here? So when you go to the community and you realize that there is an infrastructure issue here, or there's a housing issue here, or there is a legal issue here. The settlement will tell you what is the issue that needs to be tackled, not going beforehand and say, I want to solve the housing issue, but people there are quite happy with the, you know, with the housing that they have, but they have an infrastructure problem, right? So we send you there and with these interdisciplinary teams, you figure out what are the ways to understand, to research, and then to come up with uh, you know, responses who do you get involved in the response to tackling these kinds of issues? Moving from there, you have the elective term. In the elective term, the class will divide 
into at least three parts. Uh, there are four cycles of electives. In each cycle, you get to choose between two or three different subjects and people do it differently. Some decide to continue to explore new areas that they're not familiar with. Some use the electives to become more, you know, sort of focus in and specialize on an area that they came in with an interest in the beginning and sort of take the learnings from the commons and say, now that I know this, now that I know that there is these other ways to think about it, how do I re-enter the same problem? How will I look at it differently? How will I ask the questions differently, right? So people do different things. With the electives, the, you will have three simultaneous, uh, basically parallel, uh, 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 you know, sort of paths that people will take and uh, people will choose depending on what their interests are. Uh, during the electives, you also continue to do field-based work in the projects. Now, these projects are live research and live um, client-based projects, advisories to the government, for example, advisories to you know, labor collectives or to international, multilateral, bilateral grant agencies like ILO or WHO, where, you know, you get involved with actual work that's happening at IHS. You will work to client deadlines. You will work to figuring out that when a brief is given, how do you interpret that? How do you produce work that speaks to it while still sort of, you know, still pulling on this interdisciplinary learnings that you've had so far, right? At the, end of, at the end of the commons and the elective term, you come to the internship um, term. In the internship term is for two months. And basically we place students according to their interests and according to the requirements of various organizations. We have a very large network of organizations now, which include public sector organizations, government organizations, private sector consultancies, as well as you know, civil society groups, NGOs, uh, community-based groups, activist groups, research think tanks, you know, whole, a very wide range of organizations that are working on urban questions from different perspectives. And based on people's, like, you know, uh, the interest of the fellows and the interest of the organizations, um, we do a lot of sort of placements into that. Even this year, for example, we've had amazing sort of response from them. We had more than 85 organizations come for a, you know, a batch size that's like less than 35. So everybody had multiple interviews. Everybody got multiple offers uh, from these places. The one is this, like, you know, there's this whole range of the kind of organizations. The other diversity is that they come from different thematic backgrounds. So some organizations working on housing, some on land, some on infrastructure, some maybe working on you know, livelihoods or um, resource uh, uh, you know, issues or climate change or disaster risk resilience. There's a whole range of thing, topics that these organizations also work with. So we have a large range. And so we really want to place people in an organization where it will push them to start on this pathway of this urban practice. Like when they go out and do urban research and urban practice, it's like a starting uh, to that, to kind of work with an organization that uh, you know, works in that kind of a space. So, um, so, so that's the, in addition this year, I mean, last couple of years we've had, because of COVID, we've had to pull back on some of the field trip kind of issues. Like we used to have exposure uh, visits, um, immersion trips to other cities beyond Bangalore. We had to pull back on that because of health concerns. But this year we are hoping that because everything looks like it's opening up, we're gonna bring back those immersion trips as a part of the program as well. So we are going to, take students out to another city as well uh, as a part of the program. So uh, now I'm gonna quickly move to who is eligible. Like I think by now you have a sense from what I've said so far that all discipline, if you are interested in the urban, then you can be from any discipline, all disciplines are eligible to uh, apply. Typically people have either a bachelor's or a master's um, in, a, in a whole set of disciplines plus a few years of experience. 
Some come in only with a bachelor's and a few years of experience. Some come in with um, no experience at all, only volunteering experience, et cetera. These are all people who are eligible. In addition, we also consider people who have only a 10 plus two, but who have been working intensively in their community or on a particular issue and basically have experience from the field which you know, is equivalent to any kind of a graduate degree. They know more about that topic than you might, might get from a traditional degree. So we are open to, and we have in the past also admitted people uh, with a 10 plus two degree, but with a significant amount of work experience. Um, so, you know, it, it's a very open program. What we really want to, you know, sort of bring in is a very vibrant, very dynamic, very curious group of people. The other, criteria which you will see on our website is that you have to have Indian citizenship. We are constrained in that way and you have to be under the age of 30 uh, because we want this program to be about the cohort of people who are just starting out on their career paths. Um, and while every age group is, is open to learning, it really helps to have some level of cohesion in the group in terms of the age dynamic. So that's something that we are going to hold to. So there is a cutoff on the age. So please take a look at that. But more importantly, apart from like these, you know, tick boxes about like, these are the eligibility criteria. What we really want is people, you know, to apply to the program who will bring very diverse kind of life experiences to it. So people from non-metropolitan centers, cities, right? Second tier, third tier cities. Uh, people who have had, um, you know, interesting work experiences or volunteering work experiences or even community led so like they've been involved in things that, you know, that's been happening in, in and around their area, in their city. They're curious about it. We, we want, you know, it really, we've sort of seen over the years that over and above anything that we teach in a classroom, the richness of the learning really comes when people share their own stories, when they relate something that they hear in the class and they say, wait a minute, this happened, this is what you know, my experience was. And then these discussions that happen, they really embed and they give life to the teaching. Right. So this is something that we would really, you know, in the eligibility, in the eligibility criteria, but over and beyond that, this is what we look at in your application form. So as you know, the application form is now open. It's going to be open till the 11th of next month. Um, and in the application form, you will see that we ask you to write essays apart from, you know, your biographical and your educational qualifications. There are these sections which says, tell us, you know, these are long form essays. Now, please pay attention to that and please write them as genuinely as possible with as much detail as you can based on experiences that you've already had. Because this is critical. This is what actually separates you from most people who just fill it for the sake of filling it, right? And we don't really see, we get a lot of applications, like that's the other thing, right? Every year we get between 700 to 800 applications. Out of that, we choose a class of 35. So it is very competitive. And the, the way that people, you know, sort of make the edge is by talking about, you know, communicating the genuineness of their interest and their curiosity to us. When I say this, I don't mean that we want fancy English. Mm -hmm. You can write fancy English and be completely vacant. There can be no depth to what you're writing. We reject those as quickly as, you know, sort of just badly written applications, which are also lacking depth. But you can write non-fancy English. You can even write in regional language. If you're comfortable in any other language, please, we welcome applications in other languages as well. But you have to write about something that happened to you, something that you've read about, something that you care about. Show us the, you know, that what differentiates you. So if we also get lots of sort of people who've just written very quickly, you know, I open the window, oh, the garbage doesn't get collected, there's too much traffic on the road, air pollution is terrible. That is something that you thought about in the last five minutes. Believe me, we can tell when we read the applications. A thoughtful essay, fancy language or not, stands out when compared to an essay that's just been written on the fly, right? So please take the time. 
the application does take time, but please try and relate, communicate to us about your own life journey mm -hmm. in those essays. It, it makes all of the difference. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so, I mean, these are, I, I don't think I have, I think I've covered most of the points that I wanted to, but like, I will just basically end with that, that this program is something that we want to bring a lot of interesting people together in the room. It is, we take scholarship and diversity very, very seriously. So if you make the application cut, if you get admission, we're gonna make sure that financial reasons don't stand in your way. So please apply. Um, and uh, I look forward to reading your application soon. So I'm gonna stop there now. And I am going to start taking a look at the questions that you have. Okay. So um, the first question here says, my question is, does the fellowship provide any scope for placements? So like I said, the way that we do it is through the internship process, right? The internship opens you up to a network of organizations. You learn a lot more than just how, you know, just to get kind of an internship thing. You go through how to write a CV, how to present yourself in an interview, how does uh, you go through multiple rounds of interviews with multiple organizations? You learn how to do interviews, right? And you get better over time. Uh, I apologize for the noise in the background. Uh, that and people have said, even every year we get this response from people that people are shaky in their first interview, but they learn how to do it better in the second and the third interview that they do. So what we really want to do with this thing is that we want to prepare you for a lifetime of hunting for jobs or moving or figuring out which organization best fits what you want to do in the world. We don't do formal placements, but we do do informal handholding once you are, you know, at least 30 to 30% 30 of the people who go into internships are able to convert it into full-time jobs. Those that keep looking for other options, learn from the internship process and replicate it themselves. And we are here to advise you through that process. So we don't do formal placements, but we help you a lot. We do a lot of mentoring to make sure that you are not on your own. And you have an absolutely fantastic alumni network. We are a, Every year is a small cohort. So it's a relatively small alumni network, but the alumni network they go over and beyond in terms of helping every new batch, in terms of jobs, in terms of thinking through essays, writing applications, advice, you know, confusions, let's just talk. They're, they're, they're very strong and they're very, very helpful. So it, it, these are some of the larger things than just you know, sort of the placements. And so you get a lot of that kind of a support. Uh, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, I wanted to ask, is there an ideal candidate? Could you please speak about what skills, experiences you might be looking for during the selection process in relation to that? I personally, I'm about to graduate soon from a master's program. Still trying to make up my mind about whether to work as a professional or pursue higher education. Would you recommend someone like me to apply to find my niche and develop it? Absolutely. So you, Jayat, I mean, you should uh, definitely apply. Um, this program definitely has is has this kind of exploration space because you are opened up to a many new kinds of vocabularies and disciplines. People here, faculty here, come from very different sets of you know their own life experiences as well as the work that they do, and you get a lot of chance to not only interact with them in class but informally with them outside the class, and you know have long conversations about what it is that you can do going forward. So I think if you're looking to explore, if you're looking to find what, you know, what draws your interest, this is a good program to kind of hold that. There is really no ideal candidate in mind. When I say that we're looking for diversity, I actually then mean that there isn't one type of candidate that's a good candidate. Diversity actually does mean that there are many ideal types. Somebody who comes with 
you know, an incredible amount of life experience, someone who comes with a lot of work experience, someone who's theoretically really strong and conceptually can really think very strongly, somebody who's a people person, you know, who likes to work in big teams. These are all ideal types in the program. And we've had many different kinds of ideal types over the years in this program. And I wouldn't exchange that for one kind of ideal type. So I hope that, you know, begins to sort of answer the kind of cohort that you will also have. Um, commerce background student can also pursue this course. Yes, we have had many previous uh, applicants as well as students who came from a commerce background. What we look for is not necessarily that you're from the commerce background, but that from a commerce background, what is your urban question? What do you, why do you want to do this program? Because there are many programs out there. And I say this over and over again, every year to applicants is that if you're looking to specialize, if you know already what you want to specialize in, this is not the program for you. If you are looking for placements, this is not the program for you. You should actually be genuinely curious about something about the urban that draws on your life or that you have seen or you have read and you've thought about and you're grappling with, something that has left you frustrated with the existing degree that you have. If you're looking to explore, if you're genuinely looking for interdisciplinarity, then this is the program for you, right? So commerce background, definitely. But the next question is, what question do you have? What is this program going to do for you? And that's what we ask you in the essay. What is this program going to do for you? So tell us about that. And you know, if that makes sense, if there is depth to that answer, we'll be very happy to see you in the class next year. If someone has applied last year but couldn't get through, are they eligible to reapply this year? Yes, please do. We do have a, many people who apply several years and we have people in this batch as well who have applied several years and they got through and you know it, there is no uh, bar on reapplication. Um, and in fact, uh, people you know, kind of do some more things which adds to the richness of the application and makes their application stronger in the next round. So I would definitely recommend that. Please apply um, if you, even if you have uh, applied before. Um, the next question is, I'm a little confused with the audiovisual submission that we have to make. Can you please elaborate a little on what exactly we have to present? Okay, so this is, a, this is very critical. I'm very glad you asked that question. This is a sample of work. Right Now, like I said, that in the essays, we try to understand who you are. Why are you asking the question? Why do you want to be in this program? As a part of that, like I said, that we don't necessarily, we're not always looking for fancy English. We also realize that many people don't express themselves well in English. They don't express themselves well in text, but they might express themselves very well through a drawing, through a video, through a, you know, something that they have, some, some other medium that exists. or they can let their work speak for themselves, right? Like where the work speaks stronger than any text that you can write. So the sample of work is for us to kind of get a sense of other work that you have done, it, which may be in any format, right? But it gives us a window into what your interests are, what are you capable of, what have you done before, uh, what have you written before? That can also be text. It can be a report that you've written. It can be an essay that you have written. It could be an op-ed that you have put in a newspaper. It can be a cartoon, you know, a, a comic, uh, like a, a graphical novel, not a novel, maybe that's this thing, but you know, something that you have produced, uh, which is graphical. Um, portfolios, people submit a lot of portfolios. People submit uh, reports from field work that they have done. They have sent us, um, you know, they might have been involved with government programs with the implementation and deployment of government programs. They send us, you know, you know case notes and field uh, reports uh, from those. So it's a whole wide range of things. It's basically a snapshot into other ways of finding out what you are about. What are you interested in? What have you done? Right. So that's what the sample of work is. Right. And it's also supposed to give a little bit more of an advantage to uh, people who may not be comfortable with text as their means of communication. If you're more comfortable in other means, we welcome that through the sample of work. 
uh, can a student who's currently in the first year of PhD program eligible to apply? So we have had people who are in PhD programs apply. In fact, we have one this year as well. But uh, the, the thing is that you cannot do this program alongside anything else. Any other educational program, including a PhD or a job, this is what I meant that this is an immersive full-time program. You have to be doing only this. So if you can get a leave of absence from your program, from your department that says that we are giving you leave of absence for this year to pursue this program, then we are totally fine with it. But we do need that letter from your department. Everybody who's in a PhD program who's come to do this has got a letter like that from their department. So um, that's the requirement. Uh, next question is, am I at a disadvantage if I have no professional work experience uh, in the urban but have been working with certain issues in the academic field and research work? Not at all. So this is what I mean by, you know, our definitions of urban uh, go a lot beyond like traditional definitions. So for example, at IHS, urban pedagogy is something that we are doing both in terms of research. We are also working with lots of community. There are two current projects that are running in terms of where we are working with different kinds of traditional and non-traditional ways of learning, of knowledge uh, dissemination, of um, you know, knowledge systems that may not be, you know, basically like thinking outside the box in terms of what is a knowledge system um, and sort of the historicity or the, the context specific knowledge that people might have because they have been living in that area for so long. They understand the resource of that area for so long. So we have two current projects running like that. So absolutely those kinds of like urban pedagogy or generally in terms of academic and research work is very much something that we look at, is definitely covered within uh, the frame of things that we already do. So we would be happy to welcome you uh, with that background. Do we have to work on a thesis or a dissertation in the program? No, there is no thesis or dissertation. You have the practica, like I said, uh, which is, again, you know, people produce outputs across a whole set of different audiovisual mediums as well as text. You have the project in which there's a report that is often produced and other kinds of outputs that are produced. You also have assignments and long essays, et cetera, that you have to do as a part of the assignment. But we don't ask for a thesis or a dissertation. There's not enough time in a uh, nine to 10 month program that we have here. Um, in addition to the sample of work, there's also a question about audiovisual work that we may want to submit to support the application. I want to know what can that entail. Uh, Okay, so this is, uh, I think this is just basically, I think additional information, anything else that you are proud of, that you have done, that you have produced, but that is of your own doing. Like, please don't, people also send us things like, you know, this thing was produced by 10 people. And now I'm submitting that as my like additional sort of a thing in which we, in which they don't clarify which part was theirs. It's fine to submit something that is co-created. But you have to tell us that, you know, I did the script. I was involved with the photography. I did the, the set design. I did, uh, you know, the production uh, management. All of that was my this thing. Whatever it is, whatever your role was in that particular project, if you tell us, then please do. So I think if there is an additional thing uh, in terms of audiovisual work, it is to basically people have extra things that they might want to submit. So uh, it covers that. Um, but and, and it, it can be anything. It could be like on a video that you produced. It can be a website that you created. It could be um, a report that you wrote. It could be a whole range of things. Um, does UFP have any component on the urban quality of living? <coughs> urban quality of living is a is a is a is a quite a big concept. And it, does, it depends on like how you're interpreting it. There are electives that are taught on various kinds of things which would speak to this in different ways. One is sustainable building design, green building design, sustainable infrastructure systems. So there is you know, a whole set of work that happens at IHS and that is also part of the elective teaching, right? The other kinds of things that uh, is there is more traditional in terms of urban infrastructure itself. So we have this big uh, program uh, running in Tamil Nadu, some of you may be uh, aware of it. It's the urban sanitation programs, the Tamil Nadu urban sanitation program. And 
it, it's basically looking at, you know, all our cities are not meant for piped sewage network. That is not how our cities grow. But, you know, non-grid solutions like septage management is often a more healthier and more economically viable alternative, but it has to be done with certain quality controls, right? And so it goes fundamentally into an area, both in terms of infrastructure usage, but also the huge amount of employment that is there in urban sanitation and urban septage management kind of works. We know manual scavenging, people going down into drains is still very much a thing in India, right? Very much drawn along caste lines. And these are things that are also part of urban quality of living. And they have to be tackled and we have to be thinking about much larger systemic changes, both in the way the policy is conceived and the way it is implemented. So that larger concept of urban quality of living, you will get different aspects of it in various interpretations of it across uh, the program. So it's definitely something that is there, but it's not like a subject on its, like there is no, there's no one topic that is taught as urban quality of life, right? But you are provoked to think the question about what is urban quality of life? Who's urban quality of life? Who is the person that you think about when you think of urban quality of life? And what do social inequality, caste inequality, income inequality play into our perceptions of what that person is? And therefore, what solutions there are, you know, to th think about urban quality of life and we're thinking more holistically and more systemically around these questions. Uh, how will UFP help any prospective PhD applicants? Um, many of our students go on to do PhDs. Many of them are in very, very good programs, uh, both in India and outside. Um, the way that it kind of prepares you, I think most fundamentally is by really provoking the critical aspect of your thought process. Uh, this whole program provokes you to think and provokes you to reflect all the time, things that you think you knew, things that you thought you could define. We are constantly pushing the envelope for you to kind of think a little bit more, look at what's actually happening on the ground, find the questions from the ground. To design your own research project, to, produce, to, to you know, sort of craft a life of an independent researcher, these are you know, inherent skills, which unfortunately many of our programs don't really prepare students to do well. Right, to ask a good question, to frame an inquiry, to do research design in a way, to think conceptually, to link to theory that is out there, um, to be able to craft an argument, to go from description uh, to something that is analytical and something that is an argument. So these are all things that you will, you know, both in various skill labs as well as the various classes. This faculty to be critical, to be independent in thought process is something that's very central to this program. And so that's something that I think is a good training for prospective PhD applicants. The sample of work is a one page box. Can we attach the additional pages in case of portfolios and reports? Uh, I think you can, uh, but in the application, just pay attention, please, to uh, the size of the uh, document that you can upload. It gives that uh, the limit that is there. So if you are uploading something that is a larger uh, thing, then you just have to maybe, you know, reduce the file size or do some curation of the material and not just give us a dump of stuff, but give us stuff that you craft for us that here, look at this piece and look at this piece and look at this piece. And these three snapshots will tell you about me rather than, you know, 50 pages of stuff. So just, I mean, be a little sort of creative and a little bit um, thoughtful when you are sending us stuff as well. It, I, it shows, it shows a lot in terms of what we see. People have submitted portfolios and reports in the past. So I think the word the, the upload limit is sufficient for those things to be, upla uh, to be uploaded. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that's the last question. Um, yeah, okay. So 
Thank you so much. Uh, any anything else from your side, Samia? Uh, I'm very um, happy to have had this chance to talk to you all. I look forward to reading most of your applications. And any other questions you have, you know, Samia will tell you a little bit about. Uh, we have this recurring webinar format, so please join in some of the other ones as well. Um, so I'll say bye for now from my side. Thank you, Sudeshna.